Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to be discussing the concept of negative working capital as you can see right here. Now, the first thing I want to mention is that we are assuming that you already know what working capital means and also what the change in working capital means. We do have some previous coverage, including a pretty comprehensive tutorial on those topics from a few years ago, which I'll link to here in the description and also post a card for that on screen right now. This tutorial goes a little bit more in depth into the meaning of these items and then explains why companies have positive or negative working capital and also why some of the explanations for the meaning of negative working capital are incorrect. If you want this tutorial in writing with the screenshots, the PDFs and the Excel file, you can go to this URL, go to our accounting page and the negative working capital. I'll pin this as the first comment below the video as well. So you can click through and get everything there. Let's start with the very short answer. The negative working capital means that the company's current operational liabilities exceed its current operational assets. Operational means that we're excluding items like cash, debt, investments, and leases. Some longer term items could potentially be included, such as long term deferred revenue, if they're related to the day to day operations of billing customers, collecting cash, paying suppliers, and so on and so forth. So, as a very simple example of this, if you look at a company like Walmart, their working capital is negative because their accounts payable and accrued liabilities far exceed their accounts receivable and inventories. And these are the major types of line items within working capital for a retail company. When people first started trying to explain this concept, a lot of the initial explanations were something like negative working capital is bad because it means that companies cannot repay their short term obligations with their short term assets. And it means that potentially they could be in financial trouble. After that, explanations got a little bit better and people started to focus more on why working capital was negative, realizing that it means different things depending on the context. So for example, if a company collects cash from invoice customers quickly, if it cycles through its inventory quickly, and it also has the market power to pay suppliers more slowly, that could be a case where it's actually good for the company to have negative working capital. And again, that very much applies to Walmart here because of its market power, size, and negotiating power it tends to collect very quickly. It maintains a relatively low inventory for its revenue and cost of goods sold. And it simply has the market power to delay some of the payments to its suppliers more than the average retailer would be able to do. On the other hand, there's also the bad negative, which happens when, for example, a company's sales fall, it then gets lower accounts receivable and lower inventory, and it can't pay its suppliers on time. So it's not a matter of market power or negotiating power. It's just that it doesn't really have the cash flow to pay its suppliers on time. The problem with both these explanations is that, first of all, working capital by itself doesn't matter all that much because the change in working capital on the cash flow statement is what ultimately affects the valuation because that affects free cash flow, unlevered free cash flow, and many other metrics you'd use to value a company. The second issue, though, is that even when working capital matters, so even when a company's negative working capital is significant, usually the issues that you can tell from that negative working capital are pretty obvious when you look at other metrics, such as the company's revenue and margin trends and return on invested capital, for example. So this is why we don't really think negative working capital means all that much. I don't normally like to use memes to teach, but I think this high IQ, low IQ meme is very much true here. In the middle of the curve, you have people talking about how negative working capital could be either good or bad, depending on the rationale. Then you have some people at the bottom of the curve who don't understand what working capital is. And then at the top end of the curve, you have people who understand what it is, but they just realize that it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Saying it doesn't matter is a bit of an overstatement, but I think you get the idea. It would be more accurate to say that it doesn't matter that much compared to many other metrics you can look at. So in this tutorial, we're going to go through a comparison of Dollar Tree and Walmart and look at both their working capital levels. Then I'll show you some positive and negative working capital examples from companies in completely different industries so you can get a sense of what it means in different contexts. And then I will go through a few cases where negative working capital can actually matter and make a difference. So with Dollar Tree and Walmart, the first point is that we need to determine what goes in their working capital by looking at their cash flow statements and sometimes making a few minor adjustments. For example, some companies like to include the change in lease assets or lease liabilities within the change in working capital. And therefore to say that the lease assets and lease liabilities are part of the working capital. We don't like to do this because 
It's a bit of a stretch to say that they're related to the day-to-day -day cash flows and operations of a company. They're really more about long-term decisions that the company is making. So for example, if we take a look at Dollar Tree's cash flow statement, most of what is in the change in working capital section is fine to include. I would definitely include all of these line items, but this part where they have the changes in operating lease, right of use assets and liabilities, I would probably not include this. In fact, I definitely would not include this. And so when you go back to their balance sheet and you look at what we highlighted here, you can see that essentially everything in that change in working capital section, everything with a corresponding entry is highlighted, but not the lease assets and not the lease liabilities. Walmart is quite a bit simpler. They don't even list operating lease assets and liabilities in their change in working capital section. It's all just really the standard line items right there. And so if you go back to the balance sheet and you look at the highlights, it's pretty much exactly what you would expect. Now, if you go through the numbers here, you'll see that Dollar Tree has positive working capital and Walmart has negative working capital. So I showed you this in the beginning. Walmart has the negative working capital. Dollar Tree has positive working capital. And so some people would look at this and try to assign meaning to it and say that maybe it's better for Walmart because it means they have more market power to delay payments to their suppliers. And maybe it's worse for Dollar Tree because it means they need to keep more inventory on hand relative to their revenue, for example. And there is some truth to those interpretations, but the issue here is that Walmart also has 35 times the revenue of Dollar Tree. It has higher return on equity, return on assets, and return on invested capital. Both companies have a positive change in working capital. And then Walmart is also not divesting a business segment, Family Dollar, currently as Dollar Tree is. And so as a result of those, if you go down and look at the multiples, Walmart is trading at about twice the EBITDA multiple of the public comps in this sector. And then Dollar Tree is trading just below the median EBITDA multiple for the public comps in its sector. But again, most of that is because of things like the return on invested capital being much lower for Dollar Tree than it is for Walmart. And if you look at the change in working capital figures, both companies have mostly positive figures here, although it does vary a little bit for Dollar Tree. The point of all this is that the fact that one company has negative working capital and the other has positive working capital, even in the same industry sector, even among two arguably comparable companies, just doesn't make all that much of a difference. And I mentioned this point before that you could certainly look at this and point to the working capital representing Walmart's greater pricing and negotiating power, but we think that's already pretty obvious from the size to the growth rates to the returns-based metrics being higher for Walmart. Let's go through a few examples for companies in other industries to illustrate this concept in a few other contexts. So one interesting company here is salesforce.com with ticker CRM. Now they are a subscription software company, a SaaS pioneer really, and companies like this often have negative working capital because of their business model. They sell subscription software and then they collect cash up front. Now their change in working capital is very mixed, meaning it's just barely positive and just barely negative in certain periods, which means that overall working capital makes somewhat of a neutral impact on their valuation. So if we go down to the Excel file and take a look at this, their net working capital is consistently negative because their deferred revenue is so high it far exceeds their accounts receivable and all their other assets here. And then of course the accounts payable and accrued expenses add something as well. But working capital is negative primarily because of this deferred revenue balance. But the interesting part is that in the change in working capital here, despite the fact that deferred revenue going up is boosting the change in working capital, turning it very positive, the overall change in working capital is sort of flipping between just barely positive and just barely negative over time because we do have the cash commission cost to factor in, and then a few other line items here, like the consistently increasing accounts receivable is reducing the change in working capital and making it more negative. So the bottom line is that in this case, the negative working capital doesn't really mean that much for valuation purposes. It tells us a little bit about the company's business model, but we could have already figured that out just by reading the front page of the company's annual report. Let's look at another example for Illinois Toolworks. Now this company has a positive working capital and more of a mixed to negative change in working capital. And the short, simple explanation is that we expect this for a manufacturing company with physical products and mostly enterprise clients. So let's go down and take a look at this one. For Illinois Toolworks, the issue here is that 
their receivable and inventory balances are both fairly high and they're both effectively above their accrued expenses and the accounts payable lines here. So what this means is that the company has to pay its suppliers more quickly than it can collect from its customers and then it can cycle through its inventory. And so you could look at that and say, well, that's negative. And so as a result, the positive working capital that the company has is a negative indicator for their operations or valuation. But we would say in this case, that's not really true because this is sort of what you would expect in this industry. If you have much larger companies as clients, you sort of expect this situation. And the change in working capital here flips from being negative to positive to slightly negative. Overall, it probably makes a slightly negative impact on their valuation, but that's exactly what you would expect for this type of manufacturing company that needs inventory and raw materials to sell its products. And then one final example is for McDonald's, which is well known for frequently having negative working capital. It's mostly a franchise company, and so it has negative working capital because its AR, inventory, and many other items on the asset side are lower than you might expect since it doesn't directly own all its stores. Let's go down and take a look at this. So they have negative working capital in two out of three years here. And it's really for the reasons I mentioned, their inventories are almost negligible. Accounts receivable is a decent number, but it's usually outweighed by accounts payable, accrued expenses, and income taxes payable on the other side. If you look at their change in working capital, this is consistently negative. And so this is a good example where someone could look at this and draw one conclusion from the working capital and say that it's good and it reflects the strong franchise business model that McDonald's has. But then if you look at the change in working capital, you can see that despite its business model, this is actually going to reduce its free cash flow and it's going to push down its valuation if you run a DCF on a company like McDonald's. Now, it doesn't mean it's a bad business or anything like that at all. It just means that this one specific component is going to reduce its valuation. Let's go to the last point here and talk about whether negative working capital ever matters or makes a difference. I can think of two specific cases where it might. The first is when you're analyzing a stressed or distressed company, working capital can be more significant here because if it's negative, it could indicate the company has some cash flow collection or supplier payment issues. And then the second case is if you are analyzing a small business or a startup, it might be growing very quickly, but if the working capital management is poor, so maybe their cash collection takes too long, they have to chase down customers, they don't have good automated processes in place, the company could run into major cash flow issues even if they have reasonable margins and pretty solid growth rates. Of the two, I would say that case number two is probably the strongest argument for taking negative working capital seriously because in this case, it actually gives you some additional information. If you just look at the growth rates or the margins or the returns based metrics for this type of company, you probably wouldn't see these types of cash flow issues. Whereas in the first case with stressed and distressed companies, you can usually tell that something's going wrong before you even consider looking at working capital. So we'd say it's not quite as useful there. It's more of a supplemental metric in that case. That's about it. So let's do a quick recap and summary. We looked at this comparison between Dollar Tree and Walmart. And the conclusion here is that the fact that Walmart has negative working capital and the fact that Dollar Tree has positive working capital makes almost no difference because they both have positive changes in working capital, which is what really matters for valuation purposes. And Walmart is clearly much bigger and more efficient, so it trades at a higher valuation multiple. Then we looked at a couple working capital examples for other companies and saw that sometimes working capital can be negative because of upfront cash collection for subscription services. Sometimes it can be positive if a company is serving much larger customers and doesn't have as much market or negotiating power. And then sometimes it can be negative if a company has less of a physical footprint than you might expect for its size. But in all these cases, the change in working capital tells you something of a different story than working capital itself. And also in all these cases, we'd say that working capital by itself doesn't really tell us that much that we don't already know from understanding the company's business model. There are some cases where negative working capital might tell you something useful, such as with stressed or distressed companies. But I think the most important one is when you're analyzing a small business or startup or other growth company where the working capital information can actually give you some additional context around the cash flows and where you can't really get that context just by looking at the growth rates or the margins, for example. So that's about it. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about this concept and when 
negative working capital matters and when and why it usually does not.